Okay, welcome to the panel discussion on the so science and social impact of COVID-19 vaccines. And for those of you who are new here, welcome to Researchers One. Uh, my name is Harry Crane. I'm one of the co-founders of Researchers One along with Ryan Martin. We started this platform about two years ago. We started as a publication platform, but since then we've expanded uh, quite a bit and working towards a, a more expansive platform, which is more of a decentralized research hub for open access publication, peer review, conferences and live events like the, like the kind that you're watching right now. And all of this for the purpose of facilitating interaction and engagement between academic researchers and the general public. And so that's what we have here today. This event is the first of a number of events that we have planned over the coming several weeks and months. And uh, these are going to be events that talk about topical issues such as the one we're talking here today, the COVID-19 vaccine. So we would ask you to stay, stay tuned and stay aware, uh, looking out for those announcements. And also I would solicit any suggestions that you might have for any, um, any other events that you might like to see or any other topics that you'd like to discuss. We'd be happy to work with you on that um, to the extent that we can, we can be helpful. I should also mention that uh, we are going to be launching and helping to host a couple of a couple of journal publications starting in the next couple of months. We'll be launching a new journal along with the New England Statistical Society. That'll be the, the New England Journal of Statistics and Data Science. And shortly thereafter, hopefully sometime in the early summer, we'll be, we've been working with the European Society of Preventive Medicine to host their journal called Progress in Preventive Medicine. And so beyond that, we also have uh, just our usual, the, the, the original publication platform, which anybody can publish on, anybody can uh, review for. And so we would certainly encourage all of you to consider doing so. Now for today, we have our uh, panel on COVID-19 vaccines. We have a very, um, very distinguished panel with a broad range of expertise in statistics, medicine, epidemiology, immunology, and biotech. These are individuals who are academic researchers, scientists in government, practicing physicians, and also coming from industry. And so let me start off by introducing our panel. And once we uh, introduce the panel, we're gonna get started. So our first um, panelist, Anastasios Butch Siadas, is the Gertrude M. Cox Distinguished Professor of Statistics at North Carolina State University. In June, Dr. Seattis was appointed by Dr. Anthony Fauci to serve on the Data and Safety Monitoring Board for US government sponsored clinical trials evaluating COVID-19 vaccines. Professor Seattis is also serving on the Data and Safety, Data Safety, Data and Safety Monitoring Board for the NIH NIAID um, panel on COVID-19 therapeutics. And both of these are part of Operation Warp Speed. So thanks, uh, Butch, for being here. John Ioannidis is a professor of medicine and of epidemiology and population health at Stanford University. He's an elected member of the National Academy of Medicine and co-director of the Meta Research Innovation Center at Stanford. He's, over the past several decades, been very influential in, the, in writing and calling attention to the replication crisis in science, and more recently, over the past year, has written and spoken extensively about um, COVID-19 precautionary measures, lockdowns, and more recently, the vaccine. Michael Sagner is a member of the European Society of Preventive Medicine and a fellow of the Royal College of Physicians. He has been a pioneer in preventive and lifetime, lifestyle medicine throughout Europe and now around the world. He runs a clinic called the Serena Clinic. It's a nonprofit which has two locations throughout Europe. He's also the editor in chief of the journal Progress in Preventive Medicine, which as I mentioned, will be hosted on Researchers One starting in the summertime. Paolo Rebecca is principal scientist in statistical genomics and bioinformatics at Biomathematics and Statistics Scotland. 
He's also a scientific advisor for EAM Vaccines and Immunotherapeutics which focuses on the research and development of safe, efficacious, and low-dose vaccines for COVID-19 and other diseases. So thanks, Paolo, for being here. And finally, Iosef M. Gerstein is the chairman of the Ajax Biomedical Foundation, CEO of Amuvia LLC. Ajax Biomedical supports novel research on the interaction of diet and autoimmunity, as well as scientific outreach through its Cognitum TV show. Immuvia LLC is an immuno-oncology company specializing in developing therapies for multiple myeloma. And in addition to that, Iosef has written two articles on COVID, both of which have been published on Researchers One and the most recent addressing concerns about potential fertility side effects of the COVID-19 mRNA vaccine. So Iosef, thanks for being here as well. Thank you. Okay. So I want to get started, and the idea here is to allow the panelists to discuss as much as possible. I will moderate only as necessary and po possibly to play devil's advocate to the extent that I need to, although I think that there'll be plenty to discuss based on your broad backgrounds that you all bring to this. The goal here, as, as we, I mentioned, is to discuss the science and the social impact of the vaccine and COVID-19 in general. This is a very complex problem. It's perhaps the defining uh, one of the defining challenges of our lifetimes. There's a lot of scientific breakthroughs that are fascinating and worth discussing. At the same time, there are a lot of political, social issues that, that come up, economic issues. And there are a lot of concerns about the safety of, in particular, the safety of the vaccine. And perhaps some of those concerns are for good reason. One of the concerns stemming from the speed at which the vaccine was developed, warp speed, as, as it's described. So I wanna start with um, Professor Ciadas, who worked alongside an, a team of researchers on, pro, on Operation Warp Speed, particularly overseeing the clinical trials for the COVID-19 vaccines. I'd be curious to hear your perspective, the experience you had there and anything you could share with us um, about that. Um, th um, thank you, Harry. Um, I do want to start by saying this is because there's two Greeks or Greek descents on this panel, happy Greek Independence Day, which is today. So <laughs> um, I thought I'd start a little bit by just describing, um, I've been on these data safety monitoring boards, describing a little bit about data safety monitoring boards and more specifically about the data safety monitoring board for the vaccine trials. Um, I've been on data safety monitoring boards now for about 40 years, um, involving studies, clinical trials in AIDS, cancer, diabetes, heart disease, and most recently now in COVID-19 trials. Um, right now, I'm on the DSMB for both um, sponsored trials, U.S. government sponsored trials, for both vaccines and therapeutics. Now, a little bit about DSMBs. Um, when a clinical trial is done, because the investigators and companies involved in that have a lot invested both scientifically as well as possibly financially in the treatments that are being studied, um, they're not necessarily the best people to actually monitor the study. There may be conscious and unconscious bias that's involved with that. Uh, consequently, it's become routine for large scale clinical trials to have an independent board of scientists and clinicians um, that are responsible for monitoring these clinical trials. These are referred to as DSMBs or data monitoring committees. Um, like I said, I will speak mostly about the um, COVID-19 vaccine trials. As most of you know, in May of 2020, the US launched Operation Warp Speed to accelerate the development, manufacturing, and distribution of COVID-19 vaccines, therapeutics, and diagnostics. Now the NIAID, National Institute of Allergic and Infectious Disease, decided to impanel a single DSMB in June of 2020, invited by the Institute Director, by Dr. Fauci, to monitor all the US government sponsored clin vaccine clinical trials. Again, these are randomized trials where you randomize to either vaccine or placebo. And some of these trials use the one-to-one -one randomization, others use the two-to-one and the goal was to prevent COVID-19 symptomatic 
infection. Um, the use of a single DSMB to oversee multiple trials targeting the same outcome in the setting of a global pandemic really had no precedent. So this was a, a new model for doing things. The general purpose of a DSMB is to ensure the safety of study participants and the rigor and integrity of the clinical trials. The board itself is made up of 11 members. They're from um, US, Brazil, South Africa, and the UK with various expertise in infectious disease, vaccinology, immunology, biostatistics, um, and bioethics. Um, this committee meets roughly every one to two weeks by video conference, and the meetings are usually two to three hours, and we usually discuss one product at a time. Um, there are, we were monitoring um, studies from um, Moderna, from AstraZeneca, from Janssen, and, um, and, and Novavax. Um, the one trial by Pfizer, um, the one vaccine by Pfizer was not part of Operation Warp Speed, so they had a, a separate DSMB. Okay, briefly, what a DSMB does, early on, we review the study protocol, the choice of endpoints, the statistical design, and the plans for monitoring. So there's a lot of statistical issues that are in, involved in this. Um, later on, um, we look at, um, as the studies progress, we look at the trial conduct, the accrual, the data quality, the completeness of the data, and the adherence. Um, as I said, one of the central responsibilities of the DSMB is, is for um, the safety of the participants in the study. Um, clearly, safety is a big issue, but with um, these trials are huge trials, each accruing 30 to 40,000 individuals into the study. Um, because there's so many individuals, and many of these individuals are older, many with comorbidities, um, by necessity, serious adverse events and deaths will generally occur. And so one of the challenges is to be able to try to assess the likelihood that these events are indeed related to the vaccine or not, to make sure that there is safety. And again, we use um, a, a, a combination of medical judgment among the clinicians on our, on our team, together with some statistical comparisons that can be made um, between the groups that were um, that were randomized to the vaccine or to placebo. Um, the other responsibility of the, um, of the um, Data Safety Monitoring Board is to assess efficacy. Um, efficacy, as most of you know, for these vaccine trials is defined through um, vaccine efficacy, which roughly speaking is the proportion of infections that could have been prevented because of that vaccine. Um, there's a series of interim analyses that, that that are, uh, that are described by the protocol, each of these having different stopping rules where we look at different aspects of the things. We look at the possibility of stopping early because of um, efficacy or possibly harm or possibly futility if it doesn't look like the vaccine was, is going anywhere. Um, there are a lot of challenges with these things. Um, because of the large number of individuals that are in these, in, these, uh, in these studies and the rapidity of the way the data were, uh, there were a lot of logistical issues. Um, there were political issues. Um, we were afraid of politicization. Um, and then there was this whole issue of harmonization. Um, when, when the DSMB first got many of these different protocols, they were all over the map. And one of the things we decided is that there needed to be more harmonization. So we tried our best to harmonize and we were partially successful um, in trying to find common endpoints across the different vaccines, um, um, common as much as possible, monitoring boundaries and the interim analyses, the number of individuals that they needed to get a certain power, what the type one error, type two error were going to be, what the null and alternative hypotheses were going to be. Um, this was um, a, a major thing. Um, the um, statisticians on these boards are, play an important role because we basically we're looking at data and we're the best suited to, um, statisticians are best suited to be able to assess the kind of variability that's necessary, that's, that comes about through these kind of things. So the statistician plays a really important role in this thing. And, um, um, 
And so that's indicated because there's actually four statisticians on, on this board. Okay, so I'll stop there and let the other panelists speak and then we can, people can ask me questions later about the details. Okay, yeah, thanks a lot, Butch. I'm sure we'll have a lot to follow up on there. I wanna go uh, next to get um, Professor Ioannidis in here. Uh, so Butch talked about how the, well, there's the, there's the government aspect of oversight to this and there's specifically the scientific and the statistical aspect of this, but this, um, this challenge that we have in, in COVID-19 and the vaccine in particular, this is not just a medical or a scientific challenge. This is also a public health issue. This is an epidemiological issue. And for, you know, as things have developed over the past uh, year or so, this has become a very personal, uh, this has become an economic issue. This has also become a political issue. And you've, you've written about these things for decades and also specifically in the context of COVID-19. So um, maybe you could tell us, you know, your perspective on that and how it all kind of fits together. I mean, clearly uh, vaccines uh, have been an amazing uh, development and a great success story uh, in terms of how quickly we managed to have vaccines and to, to, to get them tested. Uh, at the same time, as, um, as you describe, um, Harry, we've, uh, we've seen science being accelerated and uh, being tossed to the, the public arena uh, in, in ways that uh, are unprecedented. Uh, for, for many years, I have lamented that um, not too much science was being communicated properly to the public. Uh, you know, there was lots of fake news, lots of uh, non-scientific statements, lots of opinions, lots of uh, just sometimes experts uh, presenting no data, but just uh, their, their own personal views and very little science. And, and suddenly we saw that science just kind of spilled over to, to the general public. It, it was very rapidly developed science, uh, which you can see as good news. Uh, we've uh, done an analysis showing that uh, uh, by March 1st, uh, 495,000 scientists had published something on COVID-19 that was already uh, published in a peer reviewed journal and indexed in Scopus. So, you know, probably the numbers are even larger than that which is larger than the number of, of people who have published on tuberculosis that <laughs> it's many decades worth of, uh, of, uh, of research. Um, and, and we had an amazing number of papers. We had 3000 randomized trials launched. Uh, we have a database uh, called COVID evidence that we track all randomized trials launched uh, on COVID-19. Uh, most of them probably will not be completed. We have about a thousand trials launched in China and. Hopefully, you know, China has managed to, to get rid of the problem so they have no patients to enroll. We had 175 um, uh, trials on vaccines uh, launched very quickly. Some of them reported results uh, in, um, in negative time. I mean, the, you know, the, the press releases came out uh, uh, <laughs> in, in no time and, and they were heavily debated and uh, circulated uh, across the, the entire world. Um, very rigorous research done in, in vaccines, I think, compared to what was uh, happening in many other fields where people were just scrambling to, to get something done, some data, some evidence. Uh, and at the same time, you had hundreds of millions and billions of people uh, affected by the crisis, affected by the pandemic, affected by the measures, affected by in their everyday life, uh, in their everyday fears, in their everyday expectations. Uh, themselves, their kids, their parents, uh, uh, their ability to interact with others, with friends, even with their own family, their work, their employment, their, their future plans, their prospects. So, so all of them uh, felt that they had a reason to know more about the science and to, to engage with the science and to ask the science to question uh, some of the scientific findings and to fight for their, for their rights in, in ways that got messed up with, with politics, uh, with, uh, with very strong opinions, with conflicts of interest, with uh, just the, the complete <laughs> um, uh, kind of uh, chaos uh, uh, erupting. Um, now, this is a major opportunity because uh, we have a major opportunity to show to the general public that science is something that matters that uh, vaccines are not that horrible thing that anti-vaxxers are saying, that uh, we can do things right, that we can save lives, that we can do things quickly, um, and that we do care as scientists and as the scientific community. So, so I think it's a unique opportunity 
to give that message and to prove it uh, with our, our true behavior that uh, science is, is really the light of, of the world. Uh, and it's not something that is affected by the politics and the chaos. Many people hopefully uh, will manage to get vaccinated very quickly. Uh, we've seen that when it comes to implementation, things get more difficult uh, compared to just getting the first round of evidence, so, which is getting the, the basic science and getting the, the, the clinical trials. Uh, as, as you know, uh, the US uh, has managed to vaccinate uh, a fair proportion of uh, the population, much larger compared to uh, practically all European countries, uh, perhaps with the exception of uh, the UK, doing about the same, a bit better, um, inferior to, to Israel and a couple more countries uh, around the world. Um, we do see that this is a major challenge and it creates perhaps more tension and uh, more inequalities. Uh, we see global inequalities that have been heightened during the pandemic. We've seen that uh, the poor uh, and the disadvantaged have been hit more hard both around the world and also within countries. It's likely that something similar is happening also with vaccines. Uh, countries that cannot afford vaccines have been lagging behind in terms of uh, uptake. Even within countries that can afford vaccines, we've seen that several groups that are disadvantaged and hardly hard hit by the pandemic also are disadvantaged in getting uh, vaccinated. There's an overlaid, uh, there's, there's a layer of, of uh, anti-vaxxers trying to create a very negative climate. Uh, it's, it's something that we have to be very careful on how we handle that. Uh, if we just say that, uh, oh no, these vaccines are perfectly safe, we know that, period. Uh, there's absolutely no problem and there will never be any problem. Uh, it will be the wrong strategy because obviously these vaccines have received emergency authorization and uh, we don't have long-term follow-up data. So it's important that we are vigilant and we do collect data and we have open mind about uh, what these data might show. So it's, it's a great opportunity for, for science and for public health to really convince not just a few people, but the entire world that uh, we can do things right. And obviously at the same time, it is a danger and a threat that uh, things can be messed up in politics and chaos and, uh, and strong opinions and uh, conspiracy theories. Thanks for that. I guess I'm wondering, and I want to go to Dr. Sagner now, who on this panel has the, I believe, the unique distinction of, of being a practicing physician who, who treats patients. And so you are actively engaged in advising patients on what is the, what is the right course of action for them. We've spoken so far about maybe some of the more collective or higher level uh, issues that arise. And as, as John was just saying, there are there 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 is a tendency to maybe oversell, or there's a, there's certainly a risk of overselling the safety or the efficacy of the vaccines because nothing's perfect. And I, and I I think that these issues are perhaps only compounded by some of the missteps that we may have seen over the past year with a, a variety of the precautionary measures in response to COVID. So I'm curious how you manage the individual and collective risks when it comes to the vaccine and perhaps other aspects of COVID uh, for your patients? Thanks, Harry. Um, maybe just to, I'm just going to talk about this for a minute, but the, what we see um, in, in clinical medicine, and then um, I'd like to talk about some of the things that, that John mentioned. Um, I think in this very heated and emotional climate, as John just said, um, even scientists tend to lose track of what's really happening. It's very complex. It's very complicated. And we all, we've all seen this phenomenon that people suddenly turn into virologists overnight. Epidemiologists. Everybody is an epidemiologist now. And everybody's a clinician. So I think we have to step back and look at the the data that we have, it's obviously not enough. We need more data. But as a clinician, we see things a bit different. So maybe, uh, and obviously, um, some people think is, this is controversial, and um, especially, as I said, in this very heated um, climate. Um, most people um, who have a COVID infection, 
COVID-19 are not going to have any symptoms. Most patients are going to be asymptomatic or only, only show very mild symptoms. So that's a statement that we should see more often. And I think that would sort of skew the perception also. It does not take away from the fact that people are dying from COVID. But the, the perception of risk, individual risk, is, is very much skewed because obviously the media um, like to talk about people dying more than people being asymptomatic or not having any symptoms or mild symptoms. Um, so around, uh, it, depending on where you, um, where you collect the data, it's about 70% of the people who get infected um, that are actually asymptomatic or only show mild symptoms. So that's very important to know, and I think that should be communicated a lot more. Um, as John said, um, the, the impact of this, I think, is hugely underestimated, the long-term impact of this pandemic. And that is both related to the actual virus, but also to the political interventions. I think the vaccines and this is obviously a discussion debate about vaccines the vaccines um just to um just to spoil this for you harry i think most vaccines are safe and it's for most people it's probably a good idea to get vaccinated um as john said um we don't have enough data this was fast tracked um and we need to follow up on on patients uh, i think another um, aside from the fact that most people are going to be asymptomatic with this virus, especially young people, healthy people, and that's another point I'm going to mention in a second, it's very important to understand, and I think this is also, it's, it's almost absurd and irresponsible to talk about the vaccine, the vaccine or any vaccine, as being a solution to this global pandemic. We know that most of the uh, mutations, I mean, this virus, this coronavirus, um, thanks, thanks, Ryan. Um, I'm going to just um, some technical issues here. One second. Um, this virus tends to mutate very quickly, so we don't know. And um, uh, for the AstraZeneca vaccine, for example, it has been shown that it doesn't work properly, or it's not as effective for some of the strains. So we'll have to see whether the vaccines and which vaccines are going to be effective against which strains. It's already very, very, we, I think we can, we, we can accept the fact that we will need booster shots. We will need to um, va keep vaccinating people. This is not a, a one thing that's going to solve a pandemic. So you get your two shots and then everything's over and then two years we're back to normal. This virus is extremely difficult to get rid of, if not impossible. And I think that's something we really have to communicate. We have to tell people. Um, no vaccine is going to solve this pandemic and just make it magically go away. Um, maybe just as a last point, another thing that I don't see in the media is the fact that general health in Western societies and maybe in most societies, in most developed countries, um, general health is awful. And we know for a fact that age and obesity are the main risk factors to have for death and severe symptoms with COVID. And that's something we don't see very often. And I think that's something that we have to, to emphasize. And obviously, once this pandemic is over, once we, we learn to live with it, I think that's something we have to address because there will be other pandemics. And obviously, obesity, as an example, causes a lot of other public health problems. And um, maybe something, because obviously, um, I love John's uh, publications. Um, looking at data in general, we have to be very careful. Most of the data in biomedicine medicine is, is dodgy, and we have to be very careful when using these numbers um, and question them a lot more than we do. Okay, well, thanks, thanks a lot for that, uh, Michael. Now, I think that that's, so that's, that's going to leave us probably with a lot to discuss uh, as we move forward here. One of the things that you mentioned, of course, you mentioned that mo most vaccines are safe. And I think that that's what all of, uh, that's what primarily the panelists here are, are going to communicate. But the reason why we're having this panel partly is because there is some concerns 
whether the concerns are warranted or not, they come from perhaps a place of observation of how it's not how the government governments or the public has been communicated about things from the beginning, not just the vaccine, but other things. And so I want to now get to that point. So this is now kind of bridging the gap between the scientific and the social aspects of this with uh, Dr. Rebecca, who is a, a government scientist, also works as an advisor to an immunotherapy and a, and a vaccine company. But we get the sense all from, from hearing from all of you and from hearing from everybody that there are scientists behind the development of vaccines or there are scientists behind all of this and they're, they're, you know, they're experts in what they do and they do the best to bring good information to the public. There's also maybe a sense that the way that the governments communicate that information to the public or the way that they handle this effort isn't always aligned or is perhaps a bit disconnected from the way in which the scientists who are actually driving the research um, are doing things. So I'm wondering if uh, Paolo, Dr. Rebecca, as somebody who's, who, who works in this capacity, whether or not you have some, uh, could give some perspective on that. Sure, thank you, Harry. Yeah, so I can perhaps just tell you the story of how I got involved with this um, fighting COVID effort. So I uh, say prior to, to moving to Scotland, I've been for five years um, head of bioinformatics and sequencing at uh, an animal virology institute. Um, so that means that essentially we're studying all the genomics uh, of viruses and how they change under evolutionary pressure uh, when they move from one host to another, from one species to another one. And uh, um, so among the viruses that are uh, very well known and studied, there are some coronaviruses such as um, Okay, it's called infectious bronchitis virus, doesn't really matter, it's a coronavirus of chicken. But uh, what is quite relevant is that it is a beta coronavirus, which uh, represents an almost perfect uh, model for, for uh, SARS-CoV-2, so COVID essentially. Uh, okay, it's uh, in chicken rather than humans, but uh, uh, so uh, there the difference more or less. And, and uh, let's say according to, to our study, which were done on... Uh, um, how to attenuate the virus to uh, turn it into a vaccine, you can quite clearly see that virus uh, has a lot of plasticity in its genome and it can adapt very well to uh, changes. So the attenuation procedure works that you take the virus, uh, which originally is adapted uh, to uh, uh, replicate uh, in chicken, and you start replicating it in a, a typically rabbit, uh, kidney cells, so another another animal, and and, and it's in a, in a few months uh, the virus becomes perfectly able to replicate in the new host, which is again not a, a chicken anymore but rabbit, and uh, uh, so in the process uh, it slightly changes its own genome, and uh, uh, a few mutations, about ten are able to, uh, again, uh, make it its host uh, a move from chicken to, uh, to rabbit. And then when you reinsert the new attenuated virus into chicken, of course, uh, uh, so it is attenuated because it has learned to grow uh, in uh, uh, rabbit cells rather than chicken cells, right? So uh, it is quite clear and it is very well known uh, in the veterinary community uh, that coronaviruses are uh, um, very plastic and they have very good potential to mutate and to adapt to kind of evolutionary pressures. So it's also very well known in the veterinary community that uh, it is not a good idea to have non-sterilizing vaccines, which are vaccines that do not prevent infection from happening. That is true also for all the vaccines that are uh, being used in the field now that essentially, so uh, they reduce the symptoms uh, in almost everyone and uh, they also reduce the rate of transmission, but still uh, people are able to get infected after having been vaccinated. Um, and uh, uh, so uh, the problem with that is that you can push the virus to become more aggressive, which is again something that you observe in a, a veterinary systems where um, vaccines, the best vaccines that are available are non-sterilizing, so they do not prevent animals from getting infected. 
So that has as a result that if you do not vaccinate uh, the full population at the same time, essentially you will have uh, other viruses that start uh, 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 mutating and uh, let's say adapting against the, the vaccine and developing the ability to circumvent it and to reinfect uh, uh, even the people have been vaccinated in the first place after some, some time. So again, uh, what I just want to say is that this is perfectly well known in the VET community, uh, also where you have more data available on this kind of systems, because of course there are experiments that you can do on animals that you cannot do on humans. Uh, and uh, uh, you have many more, uh, let's say, chicken uh, uh, in so uh, that uh, uh, that uh, uh, are present uh, in the world than than humans uh, after a few years. So um, there is a lot of data, and it was perfectly known to coronavirologists that, or even to me, uh, yeah, I'm not a coronavirologist, but just again a person who analyze data about coronavirus, that uh, uh, variants would uh, very soon become an issue and that eventually this strategy of vaccinating will not be a durable one, uh, as exactly other panelists were, were saying before, because uh, uh, again, so the, the virus is going to mutate and uh, 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 develop resistance to those vaccines. In particular, I can also add that these vaccines that are available right now have a very poor design because they all focus on uh, the spike protein of the virus, which is the most variable uh, region in the virus ever. So again, it is an appallingly bad design because it is very clear that uh, uh, the virus would evolve very quickly and develop a, a, a resistance. I mean, of course, again, this is not to criticize this first generation vaccines because I mean, they've been very important to a limited number of that. It's, I mean, it's definitely recommended that in particular, if you are, if you belong to one of the risk category, categories, you get vaccinated with any vaccine that you can, I'll say, uh, get your hands on. But the, 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 the key point is that this is kind of, uh, concerning from the standpoint of public health, right? Because again, uh, there are people around who know what uh, will happen and how those viruses will evolve, but for some strange re reason that I really cannot fathom, they do not sit on advisory committees. They do not receive funding and uh, apparently no one listens to them because uh, so, um, this kind of studies are not very fashionable. So they were not fashionable before COVID. And now that there is a lot of money uh, uh, and uh, investment research circulating, you would think that now those people who have the expertise would be able to capture the money, but the money doesn't go to them. It goes to a big consortia or big universities with a big name that can capture the money. So it became, becomes uh, a pol political issue rather than a scientific one. So again, uh, the question is, uh, how is it possible that um, um, with a virus which is relatively mild, so it could have been much worse, and eventually we will have much worse viruses circulating because that's how, how the system works. Uh, our response has been so appallingly uh, bad and still we are unable to uh, communicate with people who understand what will happen and have them inform public policy and things that have a big impact on public health. Okay, well, thanks for that. And thanks. Uh, th we have one more panelist who's been waiting patiently. All the panelists have been patient and we're going to get into the general discussion. But what, what we just heard, I think, ties in with what uh, Dr. Sagner had said that maybe this vaccine is not going to be the solution. Uh, it also ties into some of the more meta scientific issues that uh, Professor Ioannidis has, has mentioned for a long time. The final final panelists who can maybe who can maybe uh, tie things together, Iosef Gerstein, uh, you've recently written a, a published a paper on researchers one about specifically uh, targeting or discussing the concerns about the fertility side effect or the potential fertility side effect. Um, you can discuss a little bit about that, but actually I'm more interested to hear after you, after that, the, the big picture view, which is that this is maybe just this uh, concerns over this one partic particular side effect, which I get from reading your, your paper, is not very well founded, um, ties into the much bigger picture of the, the various individuals, the various parties involved, the sources of information, the incentives that go from the scientists themselves to the governments 
uh, and to the general public. So could you could you give us a little bit of a perspective on that? Absolutely. Um, thank you, Harry. Uh, I, I definitely see the this as being part of a system and part of a system malfunctions. So I think that the current state of affairs as embodied in the current level of vaccine hesitancy and skepticism can be explained by three layers of system malfunction. The first layer is the asymmetry between the interests and incentives of the scientific community and the lay public. Scientists have a culture which dismisses claims absent evidence, since science is predicated on positive claims. Proving a negative is a logical impossibility. However, lay individuals can be worried by potential side effects or unknown downsides. The ease with which such potential and unsubstantiated claims can be made are many orders of magnitude easier than the pains to corral and structure the lines of disconfirmatory evidence and thorough debunking, as I had to go through the trouble of personally in regards to my publication on researchers, one uh, with the mRNA vaccine interaction and impact on fertility, of, of which there is little to no evidence. Moreover, given the interconnected and viral nature of the internet, dissemination of fear and unsubstantiated claims generally can be expected to have a far vaster reach than any thoughtful or detailed debunking. The second layer of malfunction is the corrosion of trust in the institutions of science themselves. The scientific authorities and journals, which have been rocked by the replication crisis as exposed by the influential 2005 study by Professor Ioannidis, which showed only 44% of highly cited high impact medical journal articles were replicated. This as well, as well as the very public retraction of the highly cited Lancet study on hydroxychloroquine of May 22nd, 2020, further raised questions of the strength of our system of peer review. Moreover, the public health authorities, such as the WHO, officially recommending people not wear masks on March 31st, 2020, and not reversing their decision until June 6, 2020, as well as their chief criticizing travel lockdowns in February, saying there was no need for measures that, quote, unnecessarily interfere with international travel and trade, end quote, in trying to halt the spread of coronavirus, have deeply undermined public trust in scientific authority and published research. The third and final layer of malfunction is the politicization of the coronavirus and governmental responses. Given that in the US the coronavirus pandemic struck during an election year, many politicians unscrupulously and short-sightedly took the issue deep into the political realm. With Nancy Pelosi creating a media event in San Francisco's Chinatown on February 24th, 2020, inviting visitors to, quote, come because precautions have been taken, the city is on top of the situation, end quote, that's what we're trying to do today is say everything is fine here. As well as Andrew Cuomo fueling doubt about the competency of the FDA in evaluating vaccines safety, saying on September 24th, 2020, quote, frankly, I'm not gonna trust the federal government's opinion. And quote, New York State will have its own review when the federal government is finished with their review and says it's safe, end quote. This, as well as scientific journals themselves stepping into the political fray, as exemplified by Scientific American endorsing a presidential candidate for the first time in its 175 year history on October 1st, 2020, have inadvertently caused many members of the public to simply follow the narrative of their preferred political tribe and therefore discount or ignore the evidence being generated by observational study, further increasing the difficulty of transmitting valuable information or signal, if you will, from science into action. As terrible as these system malfunctions are, especially if one takes into account their interactions, there is cause for optimism, as the percentage of Americans who would not get a vaccine has dropped to 30% as of February 21, versus a high of 49% as of September 2021, uh, of September 2020, with only 15% today saying they would definitely not get the vaccine as per the latest Pew Research poll. So that's in a nutshell, uh, where, where I think the problem lies. Thank you. Okay, well, thanks a lot. Uh, I, I appreciate that. Thanks to everybody on the panel for giving us that, um, for starting us off. And now uh, we, we have a bit of time left, so I'm sure there's plenty to respond to. Does anybody want to jump in first? I think we all agree that there have been massive failures and, um, I think most of the failures and the problems we see in, in the different systems um, won't be exposed until you know, 
maybe in 10 years we'll, we'll, we'll get some, some data on that. I just want to maybe give one more clinical example on how badly we have addressed this issue. When you look back, and most of you will remember that, there was a, a time, I think it was May, June last year, um, the media pushed the message that we are running out of ventilators globally in the UK, Italy, and so on. And that was based on a very, very bad clinical um, decision-making process. We put people on ventilators, even with mild um, respiratory problems. And we, we now know we probably killed a lot of people by doing that. And the reason is, is, is complex, but um, we have, and, and this goes to, to, to um, this leads to another problem. Um, in the UK specifically, and I think that, that was the case in Italy and other European countries as, as well as the US, um, the, the political parties and, and politicians, governments push the message that we're running out of beds. And there's a reason for that. And I remember the first cases in Italy and how the government in Italy scrambled and, and, and they didn't know what to do. They obviously went for a lockdown. Uh, which you could say is a, is a natural, maybe rational decision, um, at least the first one, um, when you don't know what to do and you, you're faced with this uncertainty. But they admitted almost every patient with, a, with mild symptoms, no symptoms, um, um, flu, uh, a cold, um, because there was, the, the, the communication was so bad that people were scared into submission and People went to hospitals, and we've seen it. I've seen it myself in the UK, in um, in Europe, just to get checked, just to see whether they have it. And obviously, that was one of the the the, the big problems in the beginning. That we 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 hospitals were packed, but not necessarily with COVID patients in the beginning. Um, that later led to the national health, um, the NHS in the, the in the UK, the um, um, national health service. Um, to to install barriers outside of the hospitals to see whether these people actually have COVID-related symptoms before they admit them. And that shows you how, how big of a problem that, that was. Um, another interesting fact is Boris Johnson was, um, maybe you know, um, the, the UK Prime Minister um, was admitted to hospital um, because of COVID and they briefly thought about putting him on a ventilator. And, but at that was around the time when the data emerged that it's not a good idea to put people on the ventilator um, with just mild symptoms or symptoms that wouldn't wouldn't necessarily um, um, in normal clinical circumstances um, make you put a patient on a ventilator and they did not because they were scared um, so this whole discussion of ventilators went out the window we replaced it with something else and those are just two examples and how badly this was managed and clinically in a clinical setting hospitals bad treatment we all have seen the U u.s president um, um promoting certain treatments um, other politicians have promoted their treatments uh, a french doctor promoted a, you know, famously um uh, his his treatment and, and and without any data without any data but the media just promoted it. Um, um, the 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 amount of bad decisions and decisions based on on really bad data is is shocking, and uh, especially when it comes to clinical treatment, where clinicians um, tend to um, show better judgment. So let me get John Ioannidis in here, and then Butch, if you wanted to add something after that. I, I think that uh, I clearly I agree with uh, with Michael that lots of uh, wrong decisions were made. I, I don't think that we should blame people because most of them were well intentioned. I, you know I can't believe that clinicians in in these ICUs uh, really wanted to kill people. Uh, of course, politicians probably had other intentions as well. You know they had their own agendas, especially in, in countries that had election years. It was just a crazy world. But. Um, but I, I think that the, the, the lesson from that is that uh, we need to be a bit more calm. We need to be a, a bit more thoughtful and uh, try to look very carefully at evidence. Obviously, it's an acute crisis. We cannot wait 
for the perfect trials and for the perfect 10-year uh, follow-up on effectiveness and safety to emerge. Um, but uh, something that I have seen throughout my career is that doing more does not mean that we're doing better. I mean, <laughs> you know, the, the, there's an inflection point that, that if you don't do anything, that's not a good idea. But uh, if you do more, um, that doesn't mean necessarily that, it, that it's, uh, it's going to be better. Now, we, we have to, to put that into perspective in terms of vaccines in, in particular. And, and the question is, uh, is it relevant for vaccines? I mean, sh should we not vaccinate more people? I don't think that we have an issue of that sort at the moment because we still have just a very small proportion of the global population that has been vaccinated. And we need to push to get more people vaccinated, especially with priority to those who are vulnerable. But I, I would argue even in this case, uh, we need to be vigilant to collect the best evidence and the, the only way to fight the anti-vax movement uh, is really to get the best evidence and, and show that we're not pre, uh, prejudiced and you know, uh, we haven't reached a, a fore, foregone conclusion that every single vaccine among the many that will be circulating probably in the next year or two is perfectly effective and perfectly safe. So uh, you all know about what happened with the AstraZeneca, uh, efficacy estimates and the, the fight with the DSMB and maybe Butch would be in a better position to, uh, to tell us <laughs> what is going on there. Um, but I think accuracy uh, in communicating evidence, not overblowing evidence, acknowledging what we know and what we do not know is uh, the right recipe in this crisis. Uh, well, just uh, one second. Um, yeah, go ahead. Th th thanks. I think you just mentioned something that is extremely important and that is not just related to, to COVID, it's related to any, anything we do in biomedical research and also clinical medicine. Doing more is not necessarily better. And I think that's something we really have to embrace. Um, we can't just um, pretend that we, 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 you saw with COVID, I think it revealed a lot of issues within the, the healthcare systems. And that is one of the key issues I think we have to address after the pandemic. Yeah, now, now Butch, uh, just to get you back in here, the, uh, I'm sure there's a lot of things that you may wanna um, address. One of the things that um, Professor Ioannidis just mentioned was uh, the long-term efficacy of the vaccine. You've, I, you've just, I believe you just written a paper in which you tried to discuss some of those issues from a statistical standpoint. We don't have the time that we, to have uh, evaluated it, but um, there are apparently some additional challenges. Uh, so maybe you could address some of that as well, if you'd like. Yes, um, first of all, uh, uh, with regards to the AstraZeneca issue, uh, I cannot comment on that, unfortunately, at this point. Um, so, um, with regards to the issue you just talked about, um, one of the things that's going on right now, because so many of these um, vaccines have been effective, um, people now um, in these trials are starting to unblind the individuals that are in the trial. And, and because of ethical reasons, are crossing them over to, um, um, to either their vaccine or people are themselves um, unblinding themselves and crossing over to vaccines that are now available to them. And so that's gonna make a, a statistical challenge um, of trying to assess whether the vaccine efficacy wanes over time a little bit more difficult because we're not going to have a comparable control group or placebo group that's going to go throughout time. So there's some, some people, myself, um, Dean Folman and some others that are, have developed some statistical methodology to try to see if we can still assess vaccine um, efficacy waning um, after the unblinding and crossover period, um, trying to use people that were more recently unblinded and, and crossed over to those that had longer term and using some statistical methods along those lines. Um, I did want to say, though, that um, although there's been a lot of missteps in a lot of the science, I feel that the vaccine trials have been very rigorous. Um, large numbers of individuals, um, well-designed studies, the results are good. 
Now, of course, we won't know what the long-term safety and long-term efficacy is going to be until time passes. Um, but all of these companies are committed to following these individuals in the study as long as possible in order to be able to determine that as best as possible. I'd just like to comment that I think that Operation Warp Speed has been an incredible success. And right now, the, the main impediment to the, the, the continued success of the project is public trust and communication. And it is exactly the myths that are being perpetrated mostly online uh, that we do not have good tools to battle that we need, that, that the scientific community needs to address and to create signal to combat the misinformation and the myths that are, that are, that are being propagated and, and instilling fear and, and vaccine hesitancy. So I'm, I'm wondering um, on this issue of the, the, the myths you talk about, I assume are referring to specifically the fertility, uh, one being the fertility concern of the, of the vaccine and, and plenty of others. Um, how does this fit in? So Professor Ioannidis, I mean, you've been writing, I mean, how do, I, I'm curious, you've written about the replication crisis for years. This is maybe a, a slightly different thing, but it, it all does at the end of the day, maybe come back to that issue of trust in science and the reliability of things that are put out there. I think in the early days of COVID, there were studies published in pub peer reviewed journals. I think you, men you mentioned earlier, there have been thousands of papers published on on this, everybody, of course, is now an expert in COVID-19. But the the issue is that you know some some of the journals, Lancet, New England Journal of Medicine, they've published things which have later been, I think, taken back or at least walked back somewhat. So this issue of trust, I think, persists. I, I think that it, this is a unique opportunity to build trust in science, or, or actually it, there's the challenge that we might lose trust uh, if we do things uh, wrong. So the whole world is watching, you know, and, and until this pandemic struck, there were a few topics like nutrition that many people were interested, in, but the vast majority of the scientific uh, uh, literature was outside the remit of the average citizen. You know, nobody cared about uh, your research on protein folding or, you know, some microarray study or, or some uh, uh, astrophysics uh, observation. So, so now everybody's watching. And uh, I think we have to acknowledge that, that science is not perfect. It is self-correcting itself. Um, it does take some time occasionally. Uh, people should be alerted that uh, mistakes will happen. Uh, I'm a scientist. This means I consider myself a champion of mistakes because I make mistakes. If I didn't make mistakes, I would not be a scientist. I would be a dogmatist. Um, so so we, we need to have some humility when we communicate with uh, the, the general public about our own work, our, our um, abilities, uh, you know, how much science can accomplish, uh, how much certainty we have about uh, some evidence or uncertainties that we have about some other pieces. And this is not easy. I, I, I think that in a, in a in an environment where there is a lot of emotion and anger and disappointment and uh, and and threats of, of people dying and it's it's not very very easy to strike a balance but but we should try it's it's a very unique opportunity to try to communicate with accuracy and with the correct levels of certainty and uncertainty about the different statements that we can make yeah, now, if, if, if we could, I mean, to, to focus on some something there specifically, um, Dr. Rebecca mentioned in his uh, opening statement that he by no means detracting from the quality of these vaccines, but to highlight that they're, they're not perfect as nothing is. Um, I think that that may be something that is, is worth going back to, if you don't mind, to just kind of just discuss briefly um, just to, to maybe make that more clear, not to not to make it sound like these vaccines are perhaps, you know, a, a bad thing, but that they're not a cure all. Uh, they may have some short term benefits, but there may be longer term issues that need to be addressed. And of course, I'm sure that there's a number of uh, companies or scientists who are working on doing those things as we speak. So maybe you could could fill in a little more details on that. Sure. sure. Um... Well, so the first thing that I want to say is that, again, this is a, it is a bit technical perhaps, but as I was mentioning before, uh, so this virus has the uh, ability to uh, change in order to 
uh, respond uh, to um, evolutionary pressure, so some pressure that is uh, uh, that's uh, uh, preventing it, it from 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 replicating effectively. And if you uh, vaccinate, start vaccinated, in particular a subpopulation of a larger population, the virus will have trouble uh, replicating in this subpopulation. But uh, uh, those uh, vaccines. Uh, still uh, are not able to completely suppress uh, viral replication. So that is um, a bad idea because essentially people are being vaccinated but still uh, get infected, uh, will become breeders of new viruses which are mutated and uh, are more likely to escape the vaccine because they, are, they have to replicate in someone who is partially protected. And so, of course, the, so there is a selection process by which the viruses that are able to replicate are also the one who are able to circumvent the vaccine. So ideally, what you would like to have is a vaccine which completely prevents uh, viral replication in all vaccinated uh, individuals. And uh, this is unfortunately uh, difficult to achieve for these coronaviruses. So it's very dependent on the virus because each virus has a very different uh, genetics and, uh, and, uh, and genomics and interaction with the host and so on. So, but for coronaviruses, uh, as I said, they have a lot of plasticity. So if you uh, um, make a vaccine that just targets variable regions, uh, essentially are forcing the virus to uh, evolve and circumvent the uh, vaccine itself. So uh, ideally what you would like to have is a vaccine which is completely sterilizing, which means that it completely prevents viral infection from happening in uh, vaccinated individuals. I will also add that as we don't have those vaccines because no vaccine uh, which is available uh, is like that, and we have started vaccination, now, uh, ideally, we should vaccinate everyone, uh, because if we don't, uh, what will happen is that as the virus keeps on replicating in vaccinated people and it becomes nastier, then uh, uh, so uh, uh, the population which has not been vaccinated will be exposed to a, uh, let's say, more aggressive virus, which is, again, what happens in uh, those uh, veterinary uh, systems where things can be uh, controlled. So again, this, uh, so starting vaccination like this uh, has a lot of implications in terms of public health. And uh, 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 when you do that for uh, um, uh, outbreaks in animal populations, you discuss the strategy and you evaluate whether it's better to, uh, you know, uh, kill infected animals, which of course you cannot do in this case or just uh, vaccinate all the animals or just vaccinate the animals which are closer to uh, infection uh, uh, outbreaks. Uh, and so uh, the thing which is quite, uh, again, astonishing to me is that no such uh, uh, discussion has been even started for COVID. And in particular, there is a big disconnect between uh, uh, public health a public health approach, which would think about these kind of things, and the clinical approaches, where of course uh, doctors uh, very admirably uh, do their best and try to, uh, you know, to 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 uh, 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 to uh, find remedies for the situation uh, at very short notice and so on. But uh, what I want to say is that there are uh, uh, important uh, implications uh, uh, which lie to interaction between again public health interventions, uh, global. A vaccination with imperf imperfect vaccines and uh, 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 that have never been and 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 uh, uh, a medicine which have never been uh, been discussed. Uh, yeah, I can add that as you say. Of course, scientists have not uh, stopped. And uh, uh, for instance, we started uh, uh, with uh, uh, this company. Uh, I'm advising uh, designing a vaccine which, in principle should be able to provide universal protection, uh, let's say for everyone and against all strains in uh, April 2020. So uh, we already knew quite uh, well what would happen. And uh, uh, so, and there are several other companies, of course, that have started working on the problem. But I will also add that as politicians 
are convinced that uh, uh, this available or the available vaccines would be the magic bullet and everything will disappear. So after you know we complete this first round of vaccination, everything will go back to normal. Uh, then finding funding for for I mean to develop this kind of second generation vaccines, which would be the ones eventually probably solving the problem, is probably extremely difficult. And uh, uh, to us, it took about one year just to convince people that there was a need for uh, better vaccines because they were saying, "Come on, I mean, so uh, there are a lot of vaccine coming up, uh, vaccines coming up. They will work and solve the problem." So, um, so yeah, we're working. Uh, to get that, but it's not uh, being particularly easy. Okay, so one of the things you said there was that the ideal situation, the ideal situation would be to um, to vaccinate every single person right now, and that play that that uh, works nicely with uh, a question that we now have from one of the uh, one of the viewers. So. As we say, as you say that um, it was mentioned earlier, and I believe it's just the case that right now the the vaccines have not been approved for general use. They've been approved for emergency use. Uh, and as I understand it, no mRNA vaccine has previously been approved for use in humans. So the, the question from, our, from Luis Alvarado is that since we cannot know about vac vaccine safety until more time goes by and we collect more evidence, what justifies the aggressive push for mass vaccination as opposed to targeting population in high-risk groups? So, does anybody have uh, want to weigh in on that? Well, so I can. Okay, no, that's okay. Please. Joseph, why don't you jump in? Well, I don't think those two things are in opposition to one another necessarily. You can prioritize high risk groups and still push for ma mass vaccination. And uh, uh, it's a, really a cost benefit analysis. Because this virus has an exponential spread, we can expect, we have a reasonable expectation that everybody over time will be exposed to it. Now, if, uh, God forbid, you get infected, you're expressing 29 different proteins, whereas the mRNA vaccine will just get you the spike. So you're, you're transiently producing the spike protein, building up an immune response, and therefore protecting yourself against future infection. Now, this has already been va validated via observational study at a large scale in Israel. So it, it does seem a little bit like a no-brainer that this is a good idea that uh, that that, that having mass vaccination will decrease overall um, mortality and morbidity from this disease. Michael, did you want to add something on clinic, clinical treatment? Yeah, um, lots of, I mean, you, um, you also did a good job at answering the question. I, I, I guess the question I would ask to you is, okay, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a lay person here, I'm not a scientist. Um, I see that the I see that this has been been approved for emergency use. Um, first of all, what what warrants an emergency? Is it an emergency at the level of the collective that this is a public health emergency, or is it emergency use for the individual? Whereas, if I'm an individual who doesn't consider myself at high risk, I wouldn't consider it an emergency, and therefore I would consider it maybe more risk than it's worth to take the vaccine. That might be one interpretation of this. Yeah. I think we have to look at risk on an individual level and risk at a collective level. Um, you as a healthy young person, you have a very low risk. If I just look at you, um, you know, se separated from the rest of society, um, you probably wouldn't need it. It's, um, it it's, 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 you probably wouldn't have any symptoms or it's very mild symptoms. But since you live in a society, you live in a community, you live in a, you, you, you're exposed to, to other people, you're exposing yourself and, and possibly you're, you're exposing other people to, to viruses that um, you carry without even knowing, um, that becomes a different issue. So I think um, uh, Paolo and Josef just made the case for, for mass vaccination for that reason, because we are part of society. And even though on a individual level, you could say you are, and this also goes for children um, and very young people, the risk of having severe symptoms is extremely low. But if you look at society and you, as a part of society and the community, larger community, that changes the whole picture. 
and that, that, that is obviously a discussion we need to have. And I think um, uh, Yosef made a good point that um, from, 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 a, from, from a political point of view, community point of view, um, collective point of view, it probably is the right thing to do. Can yeah. I just add one yeah, thing? So uh, I don't, I mean, I completely agree with Michael that, of course, that enters the realm of ethics. And so you have to uh, balance different risks. So yeah, it's probably a good decision. But what I would say is that I don't get why there is uh, this kind of misconception about RNA vaccines. So if anything, I would be more worried uh, by DNA vaccines than by RNA vaccines, because RNA vaccines, the only thing that they do, they produce, uh, as Joseph was saying, uh, they transiently produce protein, and then the RNAs get very quickly degraded by the cell, while DNA vaccines could do other things. So uh, again, uh, if anything, uh, I would think that uh, mRNA-based vaccines are particularly safe. So just technically. Just that. Yes, so I think uh, one, one thing, the uh, RNA vaccines um, uh, are, are often, there's a myth on the internet that's often spread that these are gene therapies. I just want to make a note that, that, that they are absolutely not gene therapies as we define them. Uh, and, and they do not have reverse transcriptase, they do not have a binding domain, they do not have a transport mechanism, they do not have an integrase, they do not have anything related to gene therapy. Absolutely, yeah, completely. And, Absolutely. and therefore, at least in theory, could be safer than a DNA vaccine. So, so I, I just uh, wanted to, to add a comment here. Um, I'm in favor of pushing uh, vaccination at the population level as quickly as possible and as, as widely as possible. Uh, at the same time, I'm very reluctant to espouse compulsory vaccination. So I, I think that it, this is a, a, perhaps a bit different if we were talking about max vaccination as something that is uh, um, something that we wish to see, uh, to have more people adopt uh, versus have compulsory vaccination. I, I do have lots of reservations about compulsory vaccination because I th think even the mere notion, especially in such a tense environment, may backfire and may create more problems than it solves. Uh, and uh, uh, then it opens the door to many other repercussions like you know, compulsory vaccination, how often, uh, you know, with, with bad vaccines, uh, uh, how do you test whether you need to be vaccinated again? Uh, when you decide that you're okay, uh, you know, what, what, what kind of clearance do you get? I, I think it, it just leads down a path of, of, uh, of tremendous complexity with the potential of tremendous re negative response. Uh, some of that might be actually justified. So, so I think it's one thing to say, uh, we believe that we need to push and to try to get vaccines out there and convince more people to, to use them versus say that you know, we're forcing it. To, to use them because it's a, it's a public health issue. I think this I is very, agree. very crucial. I completely agree with, with, with Professor Ioannidis and uh, everything must be done on a voluntary basis in order for it to have legitimacy. Yeah, so, so on that, so I, I wanted to get back to, uh, I wanted to ask um, John a separate question and then um, maybe ask Butch something real quick. But so one of the things that Paolo mentioned is he, he highlighted this this is a technical distinction between mRNA and DNA. These are things, and, and there's a number of other scientific um, and very technical matters here that someone, you know, someone like me, and of course, many in the general public, w this is all, of course, lost on the technicalities. Uh, you, you, you've worked quite, quite extensively in the communication, uh, in, in scientific communication, and the issue you just mentioned is something as simple as not requiring compulsory uh, vaccination, even if you want everybody to vaccinate. I mean, that's that's as much a, I don't want to say it's it's not necessarily a communication issue, but it really is getting into the sociology of it to try to maintain that cre the credibility and also the goodwill of the general public. And so I, I'd be curious if you have additional thoughts on that in terms of actually communicating the efficacy, some of the things that Butch has talked about, some of the things that people are actually doing behind the scenes, uh, the, the rigorousness of these clinical trials, what is the, um, what are some things that can be done to actually overcome, we talked about missteps, overcome some of those missteps, which have actually hurt some of the trust in what people are saying. 
I, I think that we are entering the realm of, of implementation science, which is uh, the, the last component of uh, translating evidence into practice and, and making sure that whatever we know can be implemented and uh, really get some good outcomes at the population, community, and, and global community level. Uh, and uh, we know even before the pandemic that the amount of implementation research done is really a very tiny minority compared to early discovery research or early translational research, even compared to randomized trials of, uh, of efficacy. Uh, so we need more of that. And we should not take for granted that uh, if we have an effective intervention like vaccines, for example, uh, we have solved all the problems and the answer is just, just give it and everyone will take it. <laughs> it. It will not happen. I mean, there will be hesitancy, there will be resistance, there will be people uh, who complain, there will be uh, some of them uh, with uh, reasonable thinking, others with conspiracy theories. Uh, so we cannot really say that uh, we know what works for you and therefore we have solved the problem. We, we need to find ways to deliver the messages and deliver what we know about interventions and how they can be uptaken by the community in ways that they will be uptaken because otherwise they will not. And uh, sometimes again, I come back to the maxim of doing more is not necessarily going to lead to better outcomes. Uh, we know from experience that we have in lifestyle changes, for example, that uh, even if you know what is good for you, it's not very easy to implement it. Uh, you know, ideally you would say everybody should become a marathon runner. So then you go and say, oh, uh, tomorrow you start training on a marathon. How many people are going to do that? You know, this is the maximalistic approach. It, nobody, <laughs> you know, they will say crazy Johnny and Edie says that everybody tomorrow should run a marathon. Come on, I mean, that's a joke. Uh, so if, if you go for a maximalistic implementation plan, usually you get nothing. Uh, if, if you go for something that is more realistic and for something that you have studied, how it should work and how it should be implemented and how exactly am I going to convince more people about doing the right thing? And how do I get feedback that they are doing the right thing uh, so that I can perhaps change my messaging and I can change my approach and I can change how I try to, to present what I know. Uh, that's really the way, the way to go. I, I, otherwise, we will create an even more, uh, a wider split between uh, the, the dogma of science and what poor common people out there uh, can do based on that dogma. <laughs> yeah, so now, okay, we're, 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 we have about five or 10 minutes left. And so I wanna take that time to wrap things up. Uh, and I wanna ask some pretty uh, specific questions to give us a sense of where we, where we stand actually moving forward. I wanna, Ask, um, ask Butch a couple of questions. First, it was mentioned earlier that the current vaccines are under emergency use authorization. So I don't know if you're familiar with the process, uh, I'm sure you're familiar with it better than, than I am or the rest of our viewers are. Um, what, what does it take to actually get that full approval of the FDA and how far off are we from that in terms of time and the amount of effort that needs to be um, needs to be done there. I mean, the issue is time. Um, I mean, there's no issue with regards to safety or efficacy at this point. Um, the reason they're only giving an EUA as opposed to full approval is they need a sufficient amount of time. And I'm not sure what that time is. Maybe a year's worth of, of information before that could be the case. Okay, so it's 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 not. So if a year is an accurate ballpark, it's not that long necessarily. It's not a five or 10 year period. No, 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 it's not that long. Right. And so I guess I'm also curious, we, we mentioned earlier, you're working on the data and, data and safety monitoring board also for therapeutics related to COVID-19. And so we've been talking a lot about the vaccine, but maybe we should also talk about treatments of, uh, of uh, COVID. Um, was there, is there maybe some things you can... Talk about the progress that's been made there and some of the other things that are happening. Uh, there, there's two sets of, of, of studies that are going on with therapeutics. One is for individuals um, who um, are symptomatic, but um, are early on in the, in the disease, and, and they're looking at treatments to keep them from getting really sick and going into the hospital. And then there's another group that are already sick and are in the hospital and then the sets of treatments that are they're 
being tested to see if they can get them out of the hospital and keep them from dying. So those are the, the um, two different groups. There's lots of studies going on. Um, there's been some success with early intervention um, of, of, of you know, some, some efficacy in early in, in intervention with regards to individuals that have already been hospitalized. Um, at this moment, there's been very little success with regards to treatments for those individuals, but the studies are ongoing. Uh, on those fronts. I see. Now, okay, so moving away, I guess one of the one of the things that we've discussed here is maybe we, we, this was a this was a panel on vaccines, and we've discussed how vaccines can be very effective, and for the most part, well, there's no, maybe no no immediate or major concerns about the safety or the efficacy of these vaccines, but we've also talked about them in the bigger picture, and talking about therapies and maybe, you know, perhaps the best treatment is not necessarily to avoid getting sick at all. That of course is, is the best, but um, to be in a healthy state so that when we do get sick, our body is able to fight it off and we're in a, we're in a position to actually overcome. And so uh, Dr. Sagner, you have been a, a pioneer in, in preventive and lifestyle medicine. You are a the, in particular, predictive, preventive, personalized, and participatory P4 medicine. That's what your journal is focused on, and that's what your clinics are focused on. And so I'm wondering uh, if you could maybe talk a bit about that beyond the therapies and vaccines, just some of the lifestyle um, treatments that somebody might might think about. Yeah, Th thanks, Harry. Um, I hope at some point when th this pandemic is 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 over as as we uh, know it now and things are sort of back to normal so it'll be a new normal but um back to a normal state um, of, of living i i think we we really need to take time um and review what just happened and there are a few lessons that are very important obviously what john just mentioned is essential that we First of all, I think this is very good. Doing more um, does not necessarily mean uh, that you're doing um, better. And this is something that clinicians obviously know. Um, and since the very beginning of this pandemic, pan pandemic, um, and, and that relates to any infectious disease basically on this planet, um, obesity and bad health in general is going to make it a lot worse for you. You are more susceptible and the outcomes are going to be worse. And as we all know, about more than half of the half of the population um, uh, in the US is, is overweight. The the amount of um, obese people on this planet is 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 staggering. And there are so many underlying health issues that make people more susceptible to this, um, that I think we have to pause and reflect after this pandemic and really, really dig deep. And um, John just mentioned something very important. I think that is um, at the, at the, really at the center of this um, um, chronic disease pandemic that we are still seeing. Uh, this is not the only pandemic that we have. We have a chronic disease pandemic. This is literally the number one reason um, people seek medical care um, on this planet. It's chronic diseases caused by lifestyle factors. Um, the, the, the data that we have on, on, on these diseases, how to prevent them, is so bad. And the interventions, the public health interventions, what we've been trying to do, is, 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 is almost ridiculous. Um, um, I mean, <laughs> John knows it. Um, if you look at the data, you could just, uh, it's mind boggling. And I hope that once this is over, that we can have a serious conversation about health on this planet and um, what it means to um, maintain health and, and prevent diseases um, by living healthier lives. Well, thanks a lot for that. I think that that's a, a good a good way to a good way to conclude here is on that point. We've uh, 
as, as, as Michael was saying, I guess that's what, that's what we're all after is uh, living healthier lives. We happen to be in a, a once in a lifetime uh, situation right now, but I, I found the panelists, uh, all of the discussions here, very informative for me as somebody who is not a scientist, not a doctor, I'm just a member of the public like everybody else. I can, uh, nothing that I've done actually gives me expertise to understand the science here. Um, and so I think that that's what the purpose of this panel was. I hope that the, those in attendance have found this to be informative. I've appreciated all the different perspectives. I'm sure that other people have as well. So I just wanted to thank the, the panelists one last time uh, for coming on and for sharing their perspective. And I'm sure that it's been valuable to everybody who has uh, been listening in. So thanks again, everybody. Thank you, Harry, for organizing thank this. Thank you. All right, thanks. And, thank you. Uh, thank you, everyone. Thank you. Okay, well, that concludes our panel discussion on the science and social impact of COVID-19 vaccines. I hope you found that to be a very informative and worthwhile discussion. I know that I certainly did. And as I mentioned before, this is one of many upcoming live events that we plan to host on Researchers One over the coming weeks and months. And so we would encourage you to stay tuned to that and to participate in as many events as you can uh, moving forward. We certainly have a lot in store and we're very excited about it. Researchers One is a 501c3 organization and we certainly appreciate contributions of any kind from our community, especially contributions of research material, interactions on our platform, hosting of events or any ideas that you might have for things that we could be doing to make the experience of your experience more interactive and more engaging. And so thanks again, and we look forward to seeing you next time.